So I don't have comments or discussion on it. What I do have is questions. There? Okay. So basically, uh, let me see the big picture here, is we have three happy outcomes, let's say. We have growth, we have an improvement in labor market indicators, and we have an important reduction in poverty. But then I would like to know uh, what's going on with inequality, because we see indeed inequality has declined, but it, this decline is not as important as the poverty rate declined, right? So basically, uh, what I would like to know is what is causing the poverty rate to fall, but not inequality? So I was going to this uh, UNDP report that says that um, 10 out of the 15 most unequal countries in the world are still in Latin America. So basically, that was my question for you. And I know that you are also looking at labor, um, labor as the channel for this improvement and um, reduction in poverty, but I will also like to have your input on non-labor income and the importance of social spending, because most of Latin American countries, we have a lot of cash transfer programs. So yeah, basically it's that. Thank you. So. Uh, Is it all right with you for purposes of discussion? Do we need to go over this or can we sit here? Okay. All right. So let's do this then. Uh, um, do you need the audience to have two new mics? Yes, that's my soul. So the audience. Yes, okay. How about we do this then? Then uh, people ask questions using one of the mics. Well, all right. I'll write, get I'll write the questions down, then we'll get a mic in we'll, just, we'll all turn around so that we're not sitting over on the other side of the stadium. Do you want to do questions? Yeah, let's do, let's do maybe three at a time. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. All right, let's start with the three in front. One, two, three. You're one. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, great uh, work. Congratulations uh, to the whole team. Uh, it's going to be very useful to have this information. And I have um, some questions and some suggestions. The, and probably Guillermo knows about uh, some of the curiosity that we still have from previous. Uh, no se escucha? ¿Y qué hago? Bueno, me paro. Está tratando de ser modesta. Ahora? Yes? Okay. So, the question I wanted to ask is, um, what did, why don't you look at education? The story that uh, in the book that Luis Felipe and I edited several years ago um, sort of found, and that was in 2010, so there's been much more data since, that uh, one of the key factors that seemed to drive a lot of the results in labor market inequality had to do with the expansion of education. And uh, especially access to tertiary education. And then, you know, I became skeptical and I started to look at the demand side. You know, we were still working on this with many uh, people in different parts of the world. And yes, you have demand in some countries, especially those that experience the commodity boom, but not in others. I still think that the common denominator that you will find in the, in the, uh, in the story is what happened with the expansion of education because it was a push in the 1990s. You have all that information, so you could actually integrate it to your story and have that, uh, you know, that as part of the, of the question. Um, so that, that's, uh, then, you know, um, did you do any checking? Because you, you kept telling me about that this is household surveys and not, I mean, that's okay. Uh, but some countries have a peculiar. Uh, pe the no, but even the average, the Dominican Republic, didn't it uh, actually experience growth if you look at GDP per capita? And with it, so it would be good also to identify 
contradictory stories because in your analysis that you, you, you use GDP per capita, not the per capita household income from, yeah, both, yeah, both. But, but it'd be interesting to isolate those uh, countries in which you have different macro and micro stories to see, you know, what, what's going on, <laughs> because then otherwise you'll, you'll have, uh, I mean, and the Dominican Republic is outstanding because anything, you know, GDP, I think was growing at between six and 8% per capita, and here you have negative growth. So, so, so currently, I think up to 2003, we made the crisis, a huge crisis. Sorry. What we're going to need to do is so that everybody Shout. Thanks. Uh, I'm Per Ronos from the Swedish Development Agency. I well, <coughs> thanks first and first of all and congratulations to looking or revisiting this growth employment poverty nexus. Uh, I, I think employment as the main intermediary between uh, economic growth and uh, improved welfare is it, obvious to everybody, yet this using it uh, analytically isn't done that often. Uh, I have three, or, or, well, uh, yes, two or three things I, I'd like to ask. One is, uh, did you look at the supply side of labor? Uh, for instance, changes in labor force participation rates changes in uh, dependency ratios and um, changes in, and labor force growth, not least. Because if, if the, this may vary from one country to, to another, and they would probably explain some of the residuals in your analysis. Uh, <clears throat> secondly, uh, you look at shifts from no, or develop, uh, shifts from no earning occupations or sectors to high earning sectors. And that means I suppose you capture struct um, structural change through shift of labor from one sector to another, say from agriculture to industry. Uh, but did you look at all at uh, productivity and in, uh, labor income improvements within sectors? For instance, in, in agriculture, you would, uh, do, do you capture that at all? Because that would be, um, I mean, one way to, to uh, increase or reduce poverty w would be to, uh, through uh, productivity growth within that agriculture, for instance. Uh, and lastly, you uh, 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 keep measuring th things in terms of how many labor market indicators are, uh, improve or do not improve. Uh, but some of these surely are very highly correlated. Uh, did you take that into account at all? Because it might be that if some instances say, for instance, occupation sector, typically very highly correlated, or sector and self-employment, again, very highly correlated, uh, that for some of these, there are clusters. So if one is affected, the other, all the others are also affected. Uh, hi, my name is Beatrice Muriel. I'm from Bolivia. Uh, from the Inesat Foundation, and I have uh, more comments than questions. I find it very interesting about uh, the relation relating uh, poverty with employment. In the case of, of Bolivia, uh, for example, uh, labor earnings uh, represent the 90% uh, percent of uh, household income, so that is why it is very important. Um, but uh, I think that uh, it also it is very interesting the correlation uh, that the correlation that you show, and but uh, the um, what is behind the correlations? I think it's very different in in, in countries. In the case of, of Bolivia, for instance, what we see is that uh, a high dynamics of the informal sector. The informal sector is uh, impressive. How was uh, dyna uh, the dynamics with the uh, um, we have almost uh, 60 percent um, 60 of the economic is uh, um, come from informality, is informal economics. So uh, uh, it is a, a reason what um, the 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 um, 
poverty have been reduced. In particular, for instance, in, in informal employment, the uh, real wage of informal employment growth uh, the right more than uh, 3% by year. And uh, on the contrary, in the, for the formal sector, for the private formal sector, it decreased over year. So you have uh, to see, and what, why is the reason, and many reasons, um, and one of them also it is important in Bolivia, remittances was very important for uh, the consumption, internal uh, aggregate demand, and, and so on. But I think the, the, the reasons why uh, the, uh, the indicators of uh, related with employment uh, have improved are quite different, I think, between countries. Thank you. So thank you for the questions and, and, and comments. Um, so in, in terms of um, the first question by Carla, in terms of uh, the changes in poverty and, and changes in equality, that's something um, that, that could be looked at a bit more um, systematically with um, Bourguignon's uh, triangle. Uh, but it's, it's not something that we did here, especially because we wanted to concentrate on the labor, but definitely that's something that that can be done. And regarding uh, non-labor income, uh, we try, <clears throat> we try to, um, in, in the country case studies, we try to highlight the role of uh, new programs in each of the, pro uh, in each of the countries, and, and we try to uh, highlight the role they, these programs had in terms of, of uh, moderating the impact of the Great Recession. Um, but I think that this is, um, this is something worthwhile uh, that is worth another another project. And in that sense, not as commitment, commitment to equity, CEQ, commitment to equity, uh, institute uh, at Tulane um, <clears throat> has been very useful. And I think it would be duplicating this work. There's also been some work uh, uh, on the data side at, at the World Bank, but, but, but uh, I think that part is there, or it could be another wider project, but uh, I'm not, I'm not sure about that. Um, <clears throat> regarding, so what I'll do is I'll go through these questions and if there are some piece, bits and pieces that you want to jump in, let me know. Um, so Nora, definitely uh, education, we, 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 um, so we look at this in, in this paper, we haven't highlighted it uh, in, in this uh, presentation, but we, we look at the changes in the composition of the, <clears throat> of the labor force and this is uh, <clears throat> broadly consistent with what with, with your work with Luis Felipe found and what we our work with, with Galian and Gasparini also found in terms of uh, uh, um, a story of supply that is constantly growing, okay, and, and, and so that leaves uh, more of a role for, for changes in demand, uh, for, for the changes in relative wages. Um, but of course, our conclusion to that was that we needed to know more about the story in each individual country, and, and that's what you're doing. Okay, so, no, it's not constantly, and, and it, it varies by, by, by decade, but, but uh, it's not, we still find or believe that the most interesting part is the demand part, and is the demand part, uh, <clears throat> as you s correctly said, uh, in terms of countries and, and the story of terms of trade. On the Dominican Republic, there's definitely something we need to look at there in more detail. Thank you very much, we will check on that. Um, Employment as the main, in I shouldn't have recorded that, I, I didn't write all, but you started saying employment as the main intermediary uh, between growth and welfare uh, is obvious, but seldom, not always done analytically. That should be on the, the blurb uh, on, for the book or something. Uh, so thank you. <coughs> um, so we do look in the paper at the supply side, uh, perhaps not as much as, as, as in detail as you mentioned. Um, we do not look at changes in productivity within sectors. So I agree that this is a partial structural change story in changes between um, sectors and not uh, within sectors. 
Uh, and we, we had a lot of discussions about this, how many labor market indicators uh, change. And, and, and so <clears throat> these indices, we didn't want to have an index. We didn't, we didn't give it a name. That was a step forward, I think. Uh, we don't have a name for the index. Uh, it's just Z. Uh, there are different ways to weight uh, the components, etc. We went for 1 over K, which was the, the easiest. The story doesn't change much if we do weights with correlations, etc. And you could have started by saying, why is those 16 not others or more or less? It was just a way of organizing the unwidely amount of information from all these countries all these years. But, but if you have a proposal for an index, we could have a website where you create your own index with your own weights and, and see what happens. Um, sorry, and so that is, yes, the, the, definitely in, in what is behind the correlations is different uh, from country to country. And, and again, formality and or, or registration with social security, etc., cetera, uh, is something that is very important in the region. Um, that played a very big role here and is not something we understand completely uh, what happened on average or, or uh, for each country. And so we, we need to look a bit more uh, into that in, in, in further uh, papers. That definitely formality in, in the region during this decade is something that will be worthwhile uh, researching on, on its own. Sorry, and you wanted to add something? And I was wanting to add to uh, this problem with the index. We are not sure also about the index to doing uh, just an, uh, the percentage of the labor market indicators that improved. That is why we include the, the analysis of what happened with all the labor market indicators considered one, one by one. Uh, so the indicator is just a summary, but the, the important part is what happened with um, analyzing each one separately. Um, I want to add a couple of comments to each one of the questions. So the first one, respect to the role of education. Um, so we have the share of uh, workers with high education, with median education and with low education. And we found that countries with larger increase in the share of high educated workers, for example, experience larger reductions on poverty. But the correlation was high, but was not as high as other correlation, for example, the share of high earning sectors or the mean labor earnings. With inequality is, is a, yeah, that's true. So maybe it is affecting through the channel of inequality. That's, that's definitely true and it's something that we can look at. It's, it's a very interesting point. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, uh, yeah, and the Dominican Republic story is, a, is a quite a puzzle because we found a large rate of economic growth uh, but we also found a decrease in labor, in mean labor earnings, and we found uh, a small increase in inequality. And when I, I look at the data on the Dominican Republic, and because I was striking by this fact, and what you find is that the, um, the share of labor in the Dominican Republic has decreased. So it may be a story similar to Piketty one, in which the capital has increased the, the participation on the, on the GDP, and we are not observing the the results of economic growth in the household service because they are going to the top 1% or they are going to some other part of the distribution that is not present in the household service. That may be a hypothesis. We, we should look at the data on taxes for that. Um, finally, the, the labor force participation, um, we have that in the, in, the cross, in, the, in, each, in the country papers. We didn't include this here, that here, because here we put all the labor market indicators that we put a direction on the welfare, a welfare direction. And an increase in labor for participation is not clear if that's welfare improvement or welfare worsening because it depends on the reason why people is getting into work. So that's why we didn't include it in the 16 labor market indicators. But we have that in the, um, in, in the country studies and it's something that can be looked at. And, and well, that's, that's all I'm going to say. <laughs> I just want to add something, too, and then we'll go around with another round of questions. And that is that uh, the, the country papers themselves are, are quite detailed, and they have lots of disaggregations. So you were asking, you, you were asking about changes in, in, in earnings uh, in different sectors of the economy. We actually disaggregated earnings growth, not only by sector, but by occupation, occupational position, gender, uh, uh, youth and adult, and uh, 
there may be one other one. I'm not sure. But anyhow, there are a lot of, there's much more material there in the country paper. Each one of them is about 50 pages long, uh, uh, text and, and, and accompanying tables. And uh, so, and, and just now, they're being put up as wider working papers. And so uh, everybody is invited to look at whichever one or ones you're, you're interested in. Okay, all right, now another round of questions. One, two, and uh, uh, three. And then uh, if we have more time, we'll have more questions. Hi, so it's Vada from the University of Illinois at Chicago. And so my question comes from a non-economist. So I want to make a disclaimer. I happen to be a sociologist. And I am very curious to understand or to, yeah, it's, it's a question. Like, why is it that if you are so interested in labor force participation uh, and considering that after 1986, uh, there was this big uh, flow of immigrants from Latin America, who created up to 40 million uh, now living in just one country, which is the United States, you are not considering neither remittances or uh, labor exports as a variable in your labor force participation. That will make a very interesting story, at least for El Salvador, Dominican Republic, Haiti, and Mexico. Uh, and so I am curious why like economists are not like very much into considering remittances for the region of Latin America, seeing that there is, it's not negligible. When you aggregate them into how much they ended up in only one country in a very short period of time, post-1986, that will really be a great addition for a 2000, 2010 data set analysis. And so it will be, be very much appreciated by sociologists and political scientists and others who are always looking for econometric data that to measure remittances. And there is not much out there. Developmental economics, I feel like it's being behind in understanding the migration and development nexus. So I wonder if you have like theoretical insights as of why this happens in your data set and maybe beyond your data set. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm Susan. I have a number of uh, questions which are out of curiosity. The first one is on regarding the the sectors that were driving the increase in employment in the different countries, particularly Bolivia, that is uh, uh, mainly you know, a natural resource country. We always have that belief that um, natural resources are not labor intensive. So was the growth in employment in the mineral resources or they were diversifying the sectors and such that it was other sectors that were driving the increase in employment? Another concern is the, what was happening to population, the population size, because I think it also has a bearing on the employment rate and, and uh, unemployment. So I would also like to know what was happening with employment uh, during the, the period of analysis. The other concern is uh, the relationship, relationship between employment and poverty. You told us the story that it's mainly because of increase in employment. Is it the complete story or we also there could be that the social sector, social protection, was a contributory to the reduction in poverty. And lastly, it would also be good to know what was happening to labor productivity. We've seen that there was an increase in mean earnings over time. Was it as a result of increases in labor productivity or there were just efficiency wages? Thank you. Uh, I'm Andrea Cornia from the University of Florence. Uh, first of all, a question about, uh, Roger Mo already answered a little bit uh, on the motivation. Now, if you are in an economy that grows uh, substantially for most of the period, unless you have priors suggesting that you will have a jobless growth, then uh, probably you should imagine that the labor market will uh, improve welfare. And so do you have a motivation thinking that this was a jobless growth? Probably not. And so then, okay, you provide more details, but uh, you find what was to be expected ex ante. Now, the second question is, uh, in, uh, in our volume, Ugerma, to which you contributed, and also La Jefa del Commitment to uh, Equity uh, Project, La jefa, la jefa. No, la jefa in general. Uh, bueno, uh, I mean, I think that what we learn is that the part of the success of Latin America in a, 
I mean, reducing income inequality was related to what happened to labor market policies. And these were, I mean, I repeat them, minimum wages. All the regions increased it except for three countries. Second, uh, formal, formalization of employment, uh, like uh, through institutions, like labor inspections. In Argentina, uh, what uh, Saul Kaifman and uh, Roxana Maurizio was telling us that before the, before the changes, there were three inspectors for all Argentina to check whether the firms were complying with the labor regulation. And then with La, Con el Marido y la Mujer, Kirchner, the, they, they grew to 400, 500, so they're more serious. Thirdly, wage bargaining. So the wage setting was, uh, uh, has it become more negotiated between trade unions uh, more than during uh, the neoliberal period. Now, then there has been, uh, as part of the safety net, some public works, not, not in most, many countries, but in some. And then finally, there is the issues that Nora La Jefa mentioned, that there has been a large increase in the supply of educated labor force. So this has been all favorable factors. So you, should, you could have said, uh -huh, mm, I think that these policies have been uh, uh, basically uh, revoked, and therefore I'm expecting some possible uh, negative changes. But as far as I know, they've not been uh, abandoned. Uh, and. Uh, and so the, the, key, the only doubt you may leg legitimately have, and then uh, Mariana mentioned that during 1998 Bolivia, the crisis was basically in a, not, did not hit too much because of stabilization funds. And Latin America is uh, number one in that. So, so unless you have a huge contraction of the world economy, exactly you would expect that the labor market outcomes with no changes in policies will be I mean, with all the variations you have shown, they should be positive, you know? I mean, this is not the part of the world of uh, jobless growth, you know? You don't have all this labor market rigidity which you have in Europe. So then the first one is motivation. What were your fears? Why did you do this? And second is, uh, why do you, do you think that in 2014 and 15, with the continuing crisis in the West, because th there might be a contraction, uh, induced by what happens in the world economy. And so, will, I mean, how long will, because uh, I have to write a paper with that, like the same question you asked, is it uh, structural or is it uh, transient? And my argument is to say, so far I've seen no changes in institutions, this and then the, the distribution. So they will find it more difficult to finance it. And, uh, but uh, I, don't, I don't see any reason why Latin America will become less redistributive, if not less money in the budget. Okay, let, let, me, let, me, do, just... let me do this as the chair of the session. Uh, it's now 3.32, and there's a coffee break beginning now. We'll, we will definitely answer the questions, and we would be glad to go on answering questions for anybody who would like to stay. Anybody who wants to go to the coffee break now is a good time to get up and do it before we, uh, we answer these last questions and take another round. Okay. You are excused. <laughs> okay, who wants to? Well, regarding the, the migration question, uh, the thing is that we are an analyzing the local labor markets, right? So the way the, the remittances uh, from abroad can affect the labor market indicators we are considering is um, in the, the, the importance they have in the household income. So the way they appear in our analysis is not so, so much, in fact, they do not appear in the cross-country analysis, but in the country papers, uh, they appear when we explain the evolution of the poverty rate and the inequality of household per capita income, because it is a part of the household income, it's a source of income for the, for the families. Uh, that is the way we are considering the, the remittances from abroad. Uh, that is the, the role they play. Uh, then for, for the case of Bolivia, what we have is that most of, of the, the improvements were related to the, the mineral and hydrocarbon sectors, and there was also an increase in uh, public servants, uh, so people in the public administration. Um, we didn't consider the, the changes in the population size uh, in the analysis. Um, 
maybe a way as it, the, the factories enter or this variable is in the changes of, of the labor force participation rate that we consider it, it didn't appear here in the presentation, but it appeared in each of the country papers. Um, so, um, so thank you for the, the questions. Definitely, the, I'm, I'm going to link one of them, population growth and labor export, which is minus population growth. Uh, could be could be a factor um, which which we didn't analyze and something worthwhile. Um, now I think you've hit the, all the right buttons. When I at the end we mentioned in the presentation, well, we need to understand a bit more what is going on, the mechanisms. For instance, uh, natural resources are definitely not uh, labor intensive. Okay, so they're a bit more than we think. But uh, as as Mariana just mentioned. Uh, Many countries, for instance, have export taxes, and so uh, the countries with, that benefited with higher exports and higher terms of trade also had higher revenue collection, which implied an increase in public employment. Um, but also, for instance, in Argentina, there's a, a, there was a lot of um, uh, there was a construction boom that some attribute to the increase in wealth from uh, the owners of uh, land that that appreciated a lot in value in terms of exports, etc. But it's exactly those mechanisms and, as you mentioned, uh, uh, productivity that we that we <clears throat> that need to be understood more fully to see what happened. Because uh, definitely, there's a lot of mining in Chile, and and, and there are huge mines and amazing mines, etc. But their drivers and their people running the mines, etc. Their hotels for the workers, but it's not necessarily that intensive. How that trickles down into uh, more employment besides public employment is is one of the key uh, unanswered questions, I think, and 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 that we need to know a bit more about in terms of social protection. Your question is, is uh, exactly um, the is very similar to the comment that, that Carla made. That there's definitely that's another chapter, and we could include remittances in all the other non-labor uh, earnings uh, there. Um, Commendatore Cornia. Did I have? Uh, so, as we said at the beginning of the presentation, definitely there's, um, the, the, if you want, the motivation was understanding what role employment uh, growth and changes um, had here because we have this paper where we show changes in labor supply and labor demand relative in terms of skills, etc. But we don't look. We look at relative terms, inequality, etc. We don't look at what happened with raw employment numbers. What happened with with trends besides it? And in terms of labor market policies, so on the one hand, I we definitely agree, uh, and and we mentioned that at least in the in the last or. Uh, slide, uh, there was a more labor friendly, um, a more labor friendly, there were more labor friendly policies and ambience, if you want, in the, in most countries in the region. Now, uh, but these changes happened, okay, I always give the same example, Argentina and Paraguay experience about the same changes in inequality, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Argentina has 30% export tax, Paraguay has 0% export tax. And so, the the it's very difficult to find a silver bullet. And as you say, well, formalization policies, okay, Argentina went from three to 300 inspectors. So that's a 10,000, I don't, I can't divide anymore, but it's a huge, a hundredfold increase. It's still 10 inspectors every 10 million, uh, every million people, okay? So, um, and minimum wages increased a lot in the region and, and there's certainly something to look at, uh, but they increase at the same time as wages increase. So, uh, I'm not saying it's not there, and I'm sure they played a role. Uh, I'm not sure we can attribute, like, quantify their role exactly, um, at least at the, at the um, aggregate level, as wage bargaining is the same. So there was definitely, uh, uh, there were changes in institutions, etc. cetera. Um, I think each country's own story will, will be able to attribute how much of the changes we observe can be attributed to those changes in policies. Um, the policies are still there. I'm not as optimistic. I think if 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 the if the economy remains flat in the world, even if you had some these great minimum wage policies, I'm not sure they will increase a lot much more further. Uh, 
in the near future if, if the word economy you know, doesn't pick up. And so uh, it's good that they're there and there's certainly a new floor, uh, but I'm not sure how much they will support. No, just, just to add a little bit more about the motivation of the project. Um, I think that we, we all have some expectations that we will find some positive stories uh, in Latin America, but we were surprised to find that positive story in 15 out of 16 countries. Very generalized improvements in labor market indicators. I think that we were expecting to find a, some story, some positive story, but what we found was kind of striking how generalized the improvements in labor market conditions were. Um, and I think that the motivation is not only to think about Latin America, but to think about other regions of the world, how labor market, how growth works through labor markets to reduce poverty. So in this case, we apply the analysis to, to Latin America, but it's something that can be used for, for, for performing the same kind of analysis in other regions and see what's the link between growth employment, employment and poverty. Okay, so uh, Alain, you have a question? And Roberto, you did. Are there others? Uh, okay, and Andy. Okay, so those will be the, then the last three. Just a quick point. Number one, it would be good to do a more disaggregation, especially by youth. There's clearly a big question as to how much unemployment and how much participation is created for the youth. The second is to look at the kind of trajectories of uh, wage. For example, employment in the Dominican Republic tends to be free duty zones, and there's very little labor mobility. So it's good to reduce poverty, but that as a one-shot thing, it does not lead to wage progression. And the last point I would like to make is, this is great as a diagnostic, but it really lacks identification. And at some stage, you have to worry that if you want to make causal statements about this relationship between growth, employment indicators, and poverty, you have to look for identification strategies. I mean, we are in a situation where diagnostics are good, but it's not enough in our profession. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to see that with a complete different methodology, the results are similar of we reach in the, in the, in the paper that Damila and I wrote for, for the project that uh, Comendatore Cornia coordinated a few years ago. Yeah. Engineer, <laughs> Comendatore is better. And, and so happy to see the macro analysis uh, of the relationship with the activity levels, uh, growth and employment and poverty. So <clears throat> in the case of, uh, we disaggregated in that paper between the, only between the, the Caribbean and, and North uh, and, and uh, Mexico and the Caribbean and the South of, uh, of the Colombia to the South. And we show that in this case, there is an, in the, some additional factor, for instance, in terms of trade have a direct effect on employment and on poverty reduction, independent of the effect of growth. So even taking into account growth, you take into account. And in the North, in the Caribbean, uh, and the, um, Central America and Mexico, is the rate of growth of the United States that have a direct, an additional impact on, on employment um, and the, in poverty reduction. They may be related to these remittances on, in the case. Of, but, okay, this is the comment. I have a question, uh, or maybe it's a mistake or something. That you mentioned, uh, Guillermo, the 2008 Great Recession. But uh, 2008 was the, 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 the crisis impacted the region in 2009, not yeah. 2008. <laughs> so, so talk about 2009, because it's confusing, because 2008 was the highest terms of trade of the region. So, so, yeah. yeah, the high. So the Lehman Brothers cried. It was in September. So it's the last quarter of 2008 where the prices of commodity fell. 35 percent was the fall in nominal. Do, do you buy eight slash nine, or you prefer nine? We we can. No, no, no. The recession it. was in 2009. Okay, in the region, the recession but it was. Start, we, we took even in Germany it was starting in 2009. 2009 but yeah. In Germany, the recession. Completely. was in 2009 because it was the impact after the, the failure of Lehman Brothers. 
for instance, uh, and you show in the graph that the only in 2000 you show the per capita the per capita uh, rate of growth, and you show that in 2009 the per capita rate of growth fell, not in 2008. No, in only two. That is a mistake. Right? Mm -hmm. okay, so we have ambiguity. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, just just another disaggregation point uh, about gender. I wonder to what extent the. Uh, Gary mentioned gender. I wonder to what extent there is a gender story here. Increased female labor for force participation, women getting women getting better jobs, getting better paid. Those could be really important drivers of poverty reduction. And I wonder if that's true in this case. I've got a research project that on, on this in other regions of the world. So I'd be interested to, to if you do have a perspective on that. Yes, I'm Paula Tihonen and I'm working in the Committee for the Future in the Finnish Parliament. I'm not a parliamentarian, but worked 25 years there. But anyway, Committee for the Future will travel to Latin America, that's why I'm here, and I'm, certainly I will bring to the delegation, there is com the delegation from my committee, 11 parliamentarians are traveling in October to Latin America. Very many of them first time. <laughs> And this is the, uh, I really thank for the, for the material I can bring them. But my question is, we have been discussing the Committee for the Future a lot about jobs, the employment. Um, technology and science has brought a lot of jobs, a lot of growth, a lot of, so the poverty has went down in Finland. But Unfortunately, we have noticed we are in the situation that so many parliamentarians are afraid that in the long future, science and technology with digitalization, with intellectual robots, high technology, unfortunately, there are not any, any more jobs. So for ordinary people, not even for the academic ones, so the intellectual high educated Finns. So did you see any remarks the role of science and technology? First doing great job for poverty, going down poverty, but in the future it's a risky business. Yeah, thank you. I'm Mwavu from Kenya. You show that uh, the hand count ratio fell from 40 to 20 percent, which is a 50 percent reduction over uh, a 10 year period. Actually, I think that is too much uh, reduction. And the growth elasticity of minus two also looks too high. Actually, that uh, eliminates uh, uh, poverty completely of uh, a 10-year period if the annual growth rate is 5%. Okay, so the, uh, the growth elasticity of poverty is too high, and also the fall of a 10-year period is also an unbelievably too high. Thank you. So this is a shameless self-promotion, and our <laughs> Friends, uh, Leonardo Gasparini and Maria Marchioni, just we just finished a, a book, in fact, on female labor force participation in Latin America, which I can I just received the uh, the print proof. So, um, and there's a story there. There's an amazing story. Uh, so, for Latin America, for the last 25 years, uh, male prime age, etc., has been 90, 95. I mean, it's it's up there. Um, Female labor force participation has been increasing steadily. Now, something happens in 2002 when inequality starts to fall, etc. So there's definitely something happening. Everything I look at in Latin America, there's a break in 2002. So we need to understand what happens there. So um, female labor force participation was growing on average one percentage point a year. And after 2002, it starts growing at 0.3. Okay. So there's a break there and it stops. Now, that... That is not necessarily bad news, I, so this is more qualitative, I'm sorry, but I, I was doing these interviews with people and, and there was this 
a woman who uh, was the beneficiary of a new social protection program in a uh, cash transfer program in Argentina asked her, did you st stop working when you started receiving this? Yes. What were you working? What was your job? Well, I was selling uh, band-aids uh, at, the, at a, at a, um, light, a red light uh, in, with my baby in my hands. So is that a, a, a decrease in that kind of labor force participation? It's not necessarily bad news, but there's something um, going on there. And, and we have a little bit of, of, we have this aggregation by gender and we look at it, but there is another book <laughs> On, on this, if you if you're interested, that we can that we can send you. Um, so Roberto, 2000. So yeah, 2008. Lehman was 2008. We can call it 2009. We can we can we can if we don't want to confuse people. We don't want to reinvent the the crisis. Definitely. Uh, and and so youth. The, we have a bit more degradation in the country papers, but perhaps not as much as you uh, as you would like. Um, the the story of trajectories is, is certainly very, very interesting and it has to do with the flexibility of the labor market, um, but we don't have much on that. In terms of diagnostic and, and, and identification, um, yes, but uh, we, we still believe there's a... a um, so all these 16 country uh, studies follow exactly the same structure, have the same data, comparable data, etc. So we uh, hope that some people will find massive um, amounts of uh, comparable information useful, uh, even without um, identification. And we're very careful. One gets carried away and says poverty causes or increases in earnings causes, etc. But uh, that that is only when we speak. And in some slides, we uh, we had an identification police uh, getting rid of of those statements uh, or most of those in the in the in the papers. Um, just to add a couple of things. So, in the data we for the recession, we use the changes between 2009 and 2008. So, all the data that we show about the recession is is the recession, <laughs> independently of how we call if it is 2008 or 2009, is is the effect of the recession. But it's, it's 2009. I agree. Um, and then to to answer the point about the elasticity. So, the elasticity is a percentage change. It's not. It was not a, a change in percentual point. So even if you find a 2%, 2, a 2 point zero elasticity, it doesn't mean that it's going to end in 10 years because it's decreasing by 2% by each increase in GDP of 1%. So it's, it's, it's just a relationship. It doesn't mean that it's going to end. And in fact, it will converge to zero, but it will not end uh, at any period if you made the graph. And, and the um, reductions in poverty is huge in Latin America in 2000, but that's what the data said. That's what the World Bank study says, that's what uh, another paper has, has found. It's, it's, it's amazing how much progress Latin America has done in terms of reducing poverty. And, and, uh, before Alain leaves, uh, I think that there were some hypotheses. So for example, um, there was a hypo hypothesis of jobless growth in many countries, including Latin American countries. We didn't find any evidence of jobless growth. We found uh, there's also a hypothesis of uh, growth of jobs without growth of wages, right? Okay, which is the United States, uh, month after month. And we didn't find that either. Okay, we found that, that uh, so that's where we were looking for trade-offs, for example, where something good uh, in a welfare-improving direction was happening at, perhaps at the expense of something else. Higher minimum wages, but less employment. Didn't find that. You know, so, so, so there's a sense in which we're not, you know, we're not assigning any causality other than to say uh, some of the obvious causal interpretations like moving up a downward sloping labor demand curve, we didn't get a few other things like that. But we have a long way to go before this would be any sort of causal story, country, do this. But the main thing that we're, we were trying to say is that there are, there's this widespread improvement in 16 Latin American countries, 15 Latin American countries, because one didn't have it. Uh, and and uh, this, was, this was, to me and to all of us, quite remarkable, quite a, quite a robust and strong finding, uh, and disaggregated by all kinds of things. And that's what we wanted to share with everybody and put on the table. 
So thank you all for not only for coming, but for your patience and uh, missing the coffee break. And we thank you all. <laughs>